Welcome to Spring Creek Church. We are so excited that you are with us today. If you're new and you'd like to find out more information about our church, all you have to do is text NEW to 96995. Also, if you'd like to find out all the things that are happening at our Garland campus and the things that are happening online, all you have to do is visit us on our website, springcreekchurch.org slash events for all the things that are happening here. Guys, I hope that you enjoy the service. We started giving, we were a very young married couple, you know, just kind of finding our way financially and, and what we needed to do to, to have things going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. You know, just to be generous, uh, to be consistent, you know, kind of hold things loosely because, you know, things come and go. Yeah, and I, was a pretty reasonably young Christian at that point and knew a little bit about giving and wasn't really sure about it. But, you know, Wesley was like, yeah, this is what we're gonna do. And we've done it ever since we've been married and we'll be married 36 years. It's changed a little bit where it's not like a set formula. We. Um, we definitely give, have given to the church over consistently. This, consistently over this whole time, but uh, we look at other people and organizations that we feel God is leading us to, to also give to. And on that, we do give consistently to the local church. First. You know, the first, and then from there, you know, we're using the generous heart to give to other people and organizations. What we've seen here at the church with consistent giving, the church has been able to be very active in the community, uh, have programs here for kids and adults and, and just taking care of people. That's been the focus of the church all the time we've been here. Yes. You know, uh, we think the consistency giving uh, from the time we started till now, till ongoing, is just very important because it does help you have that spirit of generosity uh, you want to help the church keep it going and then that helps you to also uh, give to others as well. Good morning and welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. My name is Pastor Jerry and I'm so excited to be with you. Hey, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Listen, I know guys, Chick-fil-A is not open today, but make sure you go tomorrow and get your number one and eliminate on your wife, daughter, or son. Listen, if you're on campus next Sunday, we want to invite you to our Soul for Sunday, our worship brunch from 1230 to 1.30. Listen, we got a food truck with a bunch of soul food on it, and you do not want to miss it. I promise you, me and Pastor Jessica will be the first ones in line. And after today's message, do us a favor and head over to Spring Creek uh, online and engage with us on our circle platform. This morning, I want to pray for us as we dive into the word. Father, thank you so much for today. God, I pray that wherever we are listening to this message, that you would meet us right there. Get the glory out of all of this. In Jesus' name that we pray, ask his blessings. Amen. This morning, I want to start with a story that happened to me when I was in the fourth grade. I was a fourth grade student at Crestfield Elementary in Waco, Texas. I would think and go on to say that if my memory serves me correctly, I was a pretty good student. Now, my mom and my dad would probably argue against that, but yeah, there's that. Honestly, at the tender age of 37, I can now hardly remember what I ate yesterday or even last week. But there's one moment that has lived on with me forever at my time at Crestview. It was a normal day at school. I walked in, grabbed my breakfast, headed down the fourth grade wing to Ms. Hutchinson's class. There I put my backpack in our cubbies, grabbed my folder, and sat in my assigned seat. Everyone else in the class got to sit anywhere, any day, except me and another kid. Not to mention we were the only two African-American boys in the classroom. The significant thing here is that my assigned seat was in the back of the classroom near the entry door. It was one of the worst seats in the entire classroom. It's almost like getting nosebleed seat at any concert or sporting event. You can't see anything, you can't hear anything. And unfortunately, anything that passed by the door now competed with Ms. Hutchison's voice and me getting my lesson for the day. This particular day, was one of my friends last day at school. Her name was Jaime. She was headed back to Hawaii to live with her family. Jaime was half Asian and half Hispanic. As she got ready to leave, the entire class hugged her and gave her well wishes and sent her on her way. I got up to say my goodbyes and I was forcefully, 
I was forcefully yanked from behind and pushed into the cubbies. It was Ms. Hutchison. She had came from the front of the classroom all the way to the back of the classroom to have this encounter. The words she said to me had stuck with me forever. She said, you don't get to say goodbye. Your kind does not have permission in my class. Your kind? Confused, shocked, and upset. I told her in good Jerry fashion, get your hands off me. And I ran out the classroom to the front office. And what should have been a moment of celebration for the entire class, for Jaime and all my classmates, including me, turned into a moment in an encounter that is forever stitched into the fabric of my mind. What was a moment of unity turned into a moment of complete separation due to the unattended divisiveness in Ms. Hutchison's heart. In my question and homework for you today, this morning, this Sunday morning, this Father's Day moment, is what thing or things in your heart have you left unattended that causes division? And what are you going to do about it? Pastor Keith always says you cannot heal what you will not reveal. And what I've learned also from the words of our pastor is what's true for some isn't necessarily true for all. But it's the sum in this particular case and moment who, the, who keeps the world, our communities, our workplaces, our home life, our parks, our schools, and our churches in a position of unrest. I want to take you back to a day in May of 1992, May 1st to be exact, after nationally being humiliated and beaten on TV by a pack of four police officers in March of the same year in the great, in the great city of Los Angeles, California. After riots and unrest sparked across that city after that moment, an African-American man went back on national television by the name of Rodney King, and he uttered these famous words and gave us all a question that still remains unanswered today after 31 years later. Do you know what Rodney asked us? He said, why come we all can't just get along? <laughs> Pope John 23rd once said, what unites us is much greater than what divides us. But I've learned that too many times in this life, we let what divides us, whether it be our skin color or our political preference or this tag of Christianity, keep us at bay and our barriers up from one another. Versus allowing our commonalities, like our stories and our histories, to bring us together to share Jesus. This morning, as we walk through the sermon of breaking the cultural divide, the first thing we must do is gain an understanding of the cultural divide. See, the cultural divide will re re refers to the differences and disparities that exist between different cultures. This divide can have a significant impact on both society as a whole and our individual relationships. Here are a few examples on how the cultural divide has affected society and relationships. The cultural divide causes conflict and tension. Cultural differences can often be a source of conflict and tension within a society. Disagreements related to cultural practices and values and ideologies can escalate into larger dispute and even violence. This can further exacerbate divisions that hinder social progress. There's also stereotyping and generalizations. The cultural divide can perpetuate so many different stereotypes and so many different generalizations about different cultural groups. This can lead, this can lead to oversimplify and biased perceptions reinforcing prejudices that are hindering genuine understanding and appreciation for what we should be calling and embracing diverse cultures. One of the biggest ones is communication barriers. Language barriers and differences in communication styles can hinder effective interactions and understanding between individuals from different cultures. Misinterpretations, misunderstandings, and miscommunications can occur, leading to conflicts and strained relationships. One of the last things I want to mention to you is limited interactions and exposures. We have our limited, some of us have limited interactions and exposures to different cultures. In a society with significant cultural divide, individuals may have limited opportunities for cross-cultural <laughs> interactions and exposure to different perspectives. The lack of exposure can contribute to the ignorance and insensitivity and a narrow worldview inhibiting personal growth and societal progress. Other examples of this is, uh, is, is intercultural, is the lack thereof of intercultural relationships and social cohesion. Addressing this cultural divide and its impact on society and relationships require efforts from all of us. 
We must do a better job of promoting cultural awareness, fostering inclusive environments, and encouraging dialogue, dialogue and exchange that can help bridge the cultural divide and promote harmony and understanding among us, not only as believers, but as people. The great Reverend Jesse Jackson once said, when everyone is included, everyone wins. A more simpler understanding of the cultural divide is by a quote by Verna Myers, an African-American diversity consultant. She's an author, a speaker, a lawyer, a corporate exec, and she's the vice president of inclusion and strategy at one of our favorite shows called Netflix. She said that diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. My question to you, who have you asked to dance lately? Jesus' example of breaking the cultural divide is perhaps most evident in his interactions with people from different backgrounds and social statuses during his time here on earth. He consistently challenged societal norms and embraced individual and people groups who were marginalized or considered outcasts by societies of his time. Here are a few examples. The first example is the woman at the well. In the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter, Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman at the well, breaking this cultural barrier between Jews and Samaritans. See, Samaritans were considered to be a mixed race and were looked down upon the Jews. Despite this, Jesus engages in a conversation with the woman, treating her with kindness and respect. He offers her living water and speaks to her about the matters of her faith, transcending the cultural divide. Later on, <laughs> later on in the same book of John in the eighth chapter, Jesus yet has another encounter. And this one is set up by the scribes and the Pharisees trying to catch Jesus off guard and trying to get some dirt on him, bringing him, bringing him a woman caught in adultery. And my Bible says in the fourth verse of John that she was caught in the very act. Now, my brain tells me sidebar. Every time I read this, if she was caught in the act, how did they catch her? Was they there? And what act was they doing? See, you got to be careful of people who always want to put your sin on display, but not their own. My mom used to always tell me growing up, mind the business that pays you. But Jesus told, but they told Jesus in the fifth verse of John that the law commands us as such should be stoned, that this woman should be stoned. And they asked Jesus, well, Jesus, what do you say? And Jesus, in his mighty wisdom, it was too hip to their foolishness and bent down on the ground and began to write on the ground. Now, the Bible does not tell us what he wrote. And I'm really so glad that WWJD doesn't stand for what would Jared do, because if it had been me in that situation, I would have wrote, if you don't get out of my, never mind. See, that's why WWJD stands for what would Jesus do. So he rose up and said, he who is without sin among you, cast the first stone. And the Bible tells us that those who heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one from another, oldest to the last, until it was just him and her. And breaking another cultural barrier now of judgment, Jesus set this, sets this woman free from condemnation of her accusers and tells her to go and sin no more. Which is, which is if Jesus could do it, who do we think we are? going to tell of someone else's issues when the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Another example of Jesus breaking cultural divide is him healing the centurion servant over in Matthew, the eighth chapter. Jesus encounters a Roman centurion who approaches him seeking healing for his servant. The Jews at that time generally despised the Romans as they were seen as occupying forces. However, Jesus commends the centurion's faith and heals his servant, breaking another cultural barrier and showing that God loves extends to all people, regardless of their nationality or their authority. These examples showcase Jesus, Jesus' radical approach to breaking the cultural divide and breaking these barriers and embracing those who were considered outsider. He consistently challenged the norms of his society, emphasizing love and emphasizing compassion and, and accepting of all people, regardless of their cultural, social status or religious backgrounds. One of my favorite, one of my favorite stories in my last story is Jesus dining with sinners and tax collectors. Jesus was known. He was a known associated. He was a known associate, known to associate with tax collectors and sinners much to the disdain of religious leaders of his time. I want to go put a pause here and go a little deeper and ask a question. Who are you known to associate with? 
See, an association is a group of people organized for a joint purpose. Ask yourself this morning, why do you hang out with the people you hang out with? Why do singles hang out with other singles or married couples with kids hang out with other married couples with kids? The answer is simple. We gravitate towards people uh, like ourselves with common interests going through a common life stage. It is a form of self-centeredness. We like to hang out with people like us because it affirms our identities, who we are. See, tax collectors was an association were considered traitors and collaborators with Roman oppressors. While sinners, a group that we're all in, nobody's excluded from that, we're all included in this sinners group, were individuals who were regarded as morally corrupt. By dining with them and treating them as equals, Jesus demonstrated his willingness to bridge his cultural and social divide, extending grace and redemption to all. Over the years, our cultural differences and our associations have made the barriers of sharing Jesus Christ harder and harder. It is important to approach this intercultural and interreligious dialogue with respect, understanding, and willingness to learn from one another. Building bridges of empathy and mutual respect can foster, it can foster meaningful conversations about faith and spirituality, creating opportunities to share Jesus. Let's dive a little bit into application which leads me to this point or practical steps we can take to breaking the cultural divide. The first thing we can do is develop a Christ centered perspective. If I can be hot for a moment, if I can be hot for a moment and be honest, open and transparent, I knew studying for this sermon that my normal routine with God wouldn't cut it. It just wouldn't cut it. I felt the pull and the desire to push past my thoughts, my feelings, and to dig deeper into a topic and conversation that would challenge us all as God's people. Breaking the cultural divide truly isn't a quick fix, but what I can tell you is going to take commitment from all of us to put down walls and to, and, and to pick up a commitment of sharing Jesus Christ through the truth in this context. There were so many different things I could say, I wanted to say, and certain things that only I needed to say. I wanted to be equipped with as much knowledge as possible, knowing that I wouldn't be able to cover it all with a topic so broad and so widely discussed. So every morning I got up and spent more time with Jesus. So often we try to develop Christian character without taking time to develop a God-centered devotion. <laughs> we try to please God without taking time to walk with him and develop a relationship with him. Y'all, it's impossible to do so. So daily, I would get up around 5.30 and spend time with Jesus. While everything was quiet and the phone ain't ringing and no emails are going out unless you were Pastor Keith. For some reason, that man was sending you an email at 4.30 in the morning. That's because he's probably up talking to the father about his children. I would get up, brew a cup of coffee, open the window blinds, and grab my Bible and sit quietly. See, Psalms 46 and 10 says to be still and know that I am God. And in my quiet time, I sat still. But while I sat still, I began to allow my mind to wander and ponder on things like, what would this world look like if we all learned to spend just a little bit more time with Jesus every day? If we learned to posture ourselves to be still instead of responding when we disagree with one another. If our cultural differences and ignorance of the world, I wonder how the world would be if we embraced one another instead of being so quick to erase one another. <laughs> then I thought about what John 13 and 34 says, Jesus gives us instructions, a new command I give you to love one another as I have loved you so that you may love one another. The truth is, I know it's hard to love when we've been hurt or marginalized. It's hard to love one another when society is steady pinning us against each other. It's hard to love when all we hear and see on TV and social media is violence and chaos at, at times. But I wonder, I wondered this morning what would happen if we really displayed being the hands and feet of Jesus and put our arms around people and show them the incredible grace of Jesus Christ. I know developing, I know developing a Christ-centered perspective on breaking the cultural divide begins with understanding and embracing the core teachings of Jesus Christ and his commands. We must show love and respect, humility and empathy and unity and diversity and learn to embrace the beauty of this diversity as a reflection of God's creation. The main, the main one is, is, is to stay in prayer and ask for guidance. 
Seeking guidance from God through prayer and study and scripture is what we must do. Asking him for wisdom and discernment and a heart that aligns with Christ's teaching on your journey to develop this Christ-centered perspective. The second thing that we can do is recognize the inherent worth and, 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 and value of every individual. Recognizing the inherent worth and value of every individual is an essential aspect promoting equality, dignity, and respect for all human beings. It involves acknowledging that every person possesses a fundamental right, regardless of their background, their abilities, or their characteristics. This principle, this principle is a cornerstone of human rights that underpins the idea that all individuals should be treated fairly, justly, and without dis discrimination. See, Jesus just didn't die on the cross based on a certain race or ethnicity group or color. He died for all. For John 3.16, one of those famous scriptures we all grew up learning, simply reminds us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Recognizing that the inherent worth and value of every individual requires acknowledging and embracing the diversity of humanity. It absolutely means understanding that each person has their own unique experiences, perspectives, talents, and contributions to offer. It's going to involve y'all valuing and celebrating differences in races, ethnicities, genders, sexual orientations, religion, disabilities, and other characteristics, rather than discriminating against or marginalized individuals based on these traits. This means that each person is deserving of respect, consideration, and equal opportunity. It also implies that individuals should be valued for who they are as human beings, rather than judged solely on external factors that we cannot control. I once heard that what we have to do is find a way to celebrate our diversities and debate our differences without fracturing our communities. The last thing I want to say and kind of headed towards the end of this is seeing the others through the lens of Jesus Christ's love. Now, y'all, this is a hard one. Currently, as a staff, we are reading a book by Brian Hansen called Unoffendable. I want to tell you something. Hansen has this radical idea for this diverse area, for this, for this diverse era, such as what if we were able to scroll, chat, and watch and respond without anger or being offended? He goes on his book to share a story about a friend named Michael, who is a very evangelical Christian and who has decided to open up a coffee shop right in the middle of what is described in the book as the usual assortment of feminist bookstores and hipster apartments and how he planned to bring in big name Christian musicians and, and concerts and featured uh, evangelical speakers. The thing is, is before Michael bought the building, that turned into a coffee shop, the building had hosted the community's biggest event, arts event of the year. It was an exhibition of art to benefit AIDS research and to feature local art, some of very intentional, intentionality transgress transgressive variety. Hansen said in his book, in quotes, we could see the cultural war coming. Well, one day, one of the event organizers just so happened to see Michael, the coffee shop owner, and to mention to him that they would be looking for a new space to host the event because he figured Michael would not, Michael, the evangelical Christian and coffee shop owner, wouldn't want that kind of crowd in this coffee shop. Well, to his surprise, not only did Michael welcome them to use his coffee shop, he also offered to pay for all the catering for the event, the wine and the hors d'oeuvres. Well, something special happened that day of the event. Instead of Michael just going and opening the building and sitting back and watching the art exhibit, Michael dressed in a tuxedo with his wife, met everyone at the front door, and offered them chocolate, covered strawberries as they entered. Could you imagine the message that Michael sent that day? With just a single act of kindness and service, he seemed that this group of people who would not normally be accepted by us Christians in the community, uh, who, not, who would not be accepted by us Christians, See, Christians in the community wanted Michael to be offended, to draw a line in the sand in regards to this group of people. But instead, Michael ignored the naysayers and served the people strawberries. He was less interested in what some Christians thought about them and more interested about his chance to introduce a culturally different offensive people to a God who loves us all. See, we have to acknowledge our own cultural biases and pre prejudices. Pastor Keith gave an example in one of his sermons that has stuck with me, and I want to share it again with you today. 
It's about a museum in Los Angeles, California, called the Museum of Tolerance. This museum is a human rights laboratory and educational center dedicated to challenging visitors' understanding, understanding of the Holocaust in the historic and contemporary contents. But the part that had my attention is that it confronts all forms of prejudices and discriminations in our world today. One of the most interesting features of this museum is that once you go inside, before you can actually see any of the exhibits, you have to make a choice. You have to choose which door to go through. Which will you enter before you enter the exhibit hall? I wanted to know what these doors look like, so I researched them and looked them up. These two doors are marked prejudice and not prejudice. You can't even begin your tour until you ask yourself, am I prejudiced? If you or I had to stand at that door based off today's sermon, which door would you think you would choose and walk through? Well, I'm going to be very honest. Me, I will walk straight to the door of prejudice. See, if I try to see if you try to walk through the other door that says not prejudice, this message pops up on the door. It says, think now use the other door. Let's think and talk about it. I'll be the first to admit that I have judged and drawn conclusions about people without even thinking. I have been quick to assume even without knowing their names or their stories or simply just greeting them. I wonder how many of us are guilty of writing people off before we ever get a chance to know them. And once we get a chance to know them, we realize we were wrong in our thinking about them. Or how about times when we've let someone else's experience with a certain individual or cultural group be the foundation of how we interact and the filter of how we engage with people. We, I, have prejudged people in many different ways. Honestly, I've sat in job interviews and seen candidates go in and before me and come out. And based upon what they was wearing, I began the comparison game of sizing them up and based on the looks and appearances and what, and what one has said comparison kills. Having prejudices just isn't singular focus. To have a prejudice means that you have a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. In those preformed experiences, my prejudices have gotten in the way of really seeing people as they are, for who they are, and loving people for where they are. I want to close with this story today. i never forget my first few weeks here at Spring Creek. It was a normal Sunday morning where I'm walking through the lobby and being the loudest one. Everyone here knows I'm loud. I know, I get the emails, Pastor Jared does not need a microphone to speak. But if you're ever in the lobby between 915 and 927, I'm sure we've crossed paths. I'm making a point to go into the lobby and to mix and mingle with everyone. This particular Sunday, I got stopped by one of our members. She was an older African-American lady. As she greeted me, we embraced for a second. She said, man, Pastor Jared, I'm so glad you're here. And I said, ma'am, I'm so honored to be here. Her next statement is what I want to lay my hat on. She said, I can't wait for you to black this thing up. In that moment, I realized either she hadn't been to this church since I started or she hadn't been to this church since I started. She had an assumption just because we shared the commonality of a skin tone that automatically that would mean I would understand what black this thing up meant. What I understood is that historically, what I understand is historically gospel music dominated the African-American church culture where the waves of three-part harmonies and the heavy bravado of a singer and the B3 Hammond organ Leslie liber and liberated spirits filled the room. It was an experience she was looking for and hopes to find it in me here at Spring Creek. What she didn't know is that God and I had a conversation years prior on what it would look like if the nine o'clock and 11 o'clock hour on Sundays wasn't still the most segregated hour in America, week in and week out. I knew the only way I was going to help change that narrative and get closer to what heaven is really going to look like was to leave my comfort zone and to join in on a different church culture and worship experience. It really turns out to be one of the best decisions I've ever made in my entire life. Coming to Spring Creek two years ago, I knew I would have to diversify my taste in music and let go of my past hurts that hadn't cleared my heart out of my heart. That culturally, I had to be open to learning and embracing so much more. Luckily, I have a pastor and an executive pastor and work colleagues that don't see me for my color, but see my heart. Are there days where we culturally disagree? Where we culturally disagree? 
Absolutely. But that, but that is the beauty of being a multicultural and multi-ethnic staff. Every Monday as a staff, we all go to lunch together. We have a little tissue box where we all submit our favorite restaurants of choice. Now, I won't tell anybody, but some people put multiple restaurants in there and cheat the system. Pastor Jessica. We all pull one and we go to that restaurant. Think about the diverse cultures of foods and cravings in that box. More so the opportunity at the table every Monday to commune with, every, to commune with, one, another, with another, one another. We don't always have to agree about the method, but we also surely agree about the message. The message is simple, y'all. We are striving to be that church that reaches beyond the four walls. We take pride in partnering and serving with local missions. The church is in the building. It's what's inside of your heart. Jesus radically approached breaking cultural barriers and embracing those who were considered outsiders. He consistently challenged the norms of his society, emphasizing love, compassion, and acceptance of all people, regardless of their cultural, their culture, social status, and religious background. His teachings and his actions continue to inspire people to work towards breaking down cultural divides and fostering unity and understanding in this world today. Let's go be more like Jesus. Have a good day.